Okay, so we shall start. So welcome again to another edition of the Concrete Math Seminar. So we have Norman, who will continue his previous talk, which will be, which this week will be titled Geometric, uh, Geometric Graph Theory Root Systems, File Group and Quadratic Forms. Hi, you get Lottie. Thanks everyone for coming. So the purpose of this series of talks is to explore these uh, remarkable graphs called the ADE graphs, which we have there up on the right, and their affine equivalents, which uh, were affine variants, which are obtained by adding the blue uh, node uh, to them. So these occur in many different areas of mathematics, and our aim is to try to uh, develop some of those adjacent areas from the graph theory. So we're taking a point of view of the graph theory being primary, and we're trying to find out how can we construct stuff from the graph theory to create a, or to touch base with adjacent things. Okay, so um, our starting point is x, which is a uh, connected, simple graph. And uh, today I want to explain how there's actually a rich geometry associated to such a graph and that this geometry is intimately connected with the mutation game that I introduced last time. So let me remind you uh, about the, what that is. First, maybe a little bit of notation. So the vertices of x, that's uh, often called x1, x2, up to xn, uh, will denote by uh, p of x is the populations on x, and by that we mean uh, integer valued functions on vertices. So it's sort of like an integral linear space. And then we have uh, mutations. So if x is a vertex of x, then we have um, s of x, which is a mutation, which maps populations to populations and it's defined by a p s of x of y equals uh, p of y if x uh, does not equal y, and minus p of x plus the sum over all z uh, of a of z y uh, p of y. So where uh, A is the adjacency matrix of the graph. Okay, what does this mean? Uh, so this means that if we have some graph and we have some population on the graph and we're mutating at this vertex here, then what happens is that the uh, population at this point changes to its negative, and then we have to add, we have to add another one, we have to add the directly uh, neighboring population, so we have to add one plus three plus four, uh, which would be a total of uh, six. On the other hand, if that same mutation there will keep all of the other ones uh, fixed. So that's the mutation at that vertex of x there. Okay, uh, so let's define some particularly simple uh, populations. So let's uh, let alpha i be, uh, call it say, a simple, simple root population. And uh, so alpha i uh, is a, the population whose value at xj is uh, delta ij. In other words, it's equal to a 1 if i equals j, and 0 otherwise. So that's the simplest kind of uh, population, just has a 1 at a, a simple at a vertex and a 0 elsewhere. And then we'll define um, r of x. So this, these are the root, the root populations of x. These are the populations that we can get to by starting with a simple root population and performing arbitrary mutations. So these are the populations obtained by 
by arbitrary mutations on simple group populations. And we'll call this, this is, we'll say that these are the roots, or well, we've already said this, that these are the root populations of X. And our theorem was that, that this set is finite precisely when X is an ADE graph. So that was one of the ones on that uh, table over there, but not including the uh, extra starred uh, vertex. Okay, and so uh, let's just have a little look at some of these root populations to get us uh, reminded of how this thing goes. So, for example, suppose that we start with uh, the uh, the A A four. Okay. This is the graph whose nodes we'll label 1, 2, 3, 4. And let's talk about what are all the roots, root populations of this graph. So if we start with the singleton, the singleton uh, ones, I might start up here. The singleton populations are uh, these ones, 1, 0, 0, 0. Well, this, this means the population which is 1 here, 0, here, 0, here, and 0 here. Okay, so this is my way of recording the values of the, the population and all the vertices. So that's... Uh, that's what we might call alpha 1. And then over here is alpha 2, and alpha, over here is alpha 3, and over here is alpha 4. So those are the four singleton populations, or simple root populations. So if we perform some mutations on them, what can happen? So if we start with this one here, so it's a single one there. If we mutate at the adjacent spot 2, then we, uh, this 0 here becomes a minus 0, and we add 1, and we get 1, 1, 0, 0. And that population, so it can be obtained from here, but it can also have been obtained from the singleton at 2 by mutating at 1. And similarly, uh, we could get uh, over here, we could get 0, 1, 1, 0, either from here or from here. We could get 0, 0, 1, 1 from here or from here. And then if we took one of these and we did another mutation to try to increase the population, which is our general strategy. Then we uh, could mutate at this third vertex, and that would give us a 1, 1, 0. That's coming from either one of those. Or we could get 0, 1, 1, 1, either from one of those. And then the maximum population, 1, 1, 1, 1, we could get from either one of those. So that's uh, not all of the roots. That's actually half of the roots. So those are the positive roots. And there's a corresponding other half, which are obtained sort of, uh, you could draw a simple similar kind of picture up here, where reflection or mutation in this one would give us a minus 1, 0, 0, then maybe a 0, minus 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, minus 1, 0, and 0, 0, 0, minus 1. And then there'd be a corresponding mirror image up on top. Yes? Sorry, maybe you just understood the definition. With the second line, it's when x is equal to y, right? They apply to two. Yeah. So there's no y in the second line anyway. Um, x. Sorry. Uh, If x equals y, this should be if x equals y. So there's, there's no need to, for y anyway. Oh, sorry, yes, I got it wrong. Um, I, I want to be adding the p of book. Thank you very much. I should be adding p of z. But still, it, oh, the, the y is not necessary. Yes, okay, so the y is not necessary. But how do you get this one in second position? It looks like this, this one here? Yes, mutations don't change anything except in the position where you apply it. That's right. So to go from here to here, yes. so let's say we started with a mutation like this. Yes. If we uh, do the population like this, if we mutate at 2, yes. then that, uh, that 0 change. changes to a minus 0. It doesn't change anything, right? Because the first line is like. Oh, but there's a, a 1. The one at one, and then like yeah. so you plus the one to the minus zero to get another one. Why? Even the first line says do nothing if you're not at x. Yeah, but where the second line says you plus all the values at the um, adjacent points. But only if you're at x. So, so, the, so let's let's apply so s of x to this. Yeah, so yeah, s of two to this. Mutation. So if we apply s of two to this, 
Great Forest. Then, then what happens is that the, the populations and, yeah, uh, and these other ones are, are zero. They stay the same. And only this one will change, and this one will go from uh, being a zero to a minus zero, a uh, plus the one. So it's just the multiple. Yeah. Thanks for correcting my error there. That's, that's, that's a crucial definition, so we have to get that one right. So, um, so that's sort of how the set of root roots look like for uh, A4. And I also want to uh, do a little bit more complicated example and show you the roots, or at least the positive roots for D4, so we can practice our mutations. So now let me label the nodes 1, 2, 3, and 0. And then the simple roots will be 1, 0, 0, 0, corresponding to a singleton there and so on. And then 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. And then there will be also 0, 0, 0, 1. So those are the four simple roots. OK, now, uh, if we do a mutation here at Point two, then we can get one one zero zero, and we can also have gotten that one from here. If we perform here uh, at the top of it, we could get one up there, so we can get that one from there, and we can also get that one from there. And then the, over here, zero one one zero, we could have gotten that one from there, or also from there. And then one one zero one, we can get that from there. One 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 zero, get that from here or here. Zero one one one, get from here or from here. And this one we can get from there or there. And then from any one of those, we could get one 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 one. And then there's one more that we could get. Uh, we could get one, two, one, one, which is the maximum population. So that's uh, R plus D4. And there's a corresponding set of negative roots, which are just the negatives of, of these ones. So we see that, first of all, we get a bit of combinatorial structure here. We're seeing some kind of poset like object. It's actually labeled. The edges are naturally labeled by the mutations that send us from one node to another. So this, this edge here could be labeled. We've done a mutation at 2, so I, like, I could label it S sub 2, for example. And so all of these um, edges could be labeled by the, the simple reflections of the simple mutations, S1, S2, S3, S0. It's an excellent uh, exercise, if you're interested in this subject, to generate such diagrams for the root systems of the other ones. By the time you get down to E8, uh, it'll already be quite uh, challenging because there will be 120 objects in this uh, post set. But it's still doable and it's uh, very interesting and uh, very important for lots of things. Okay, so now uh, let's look more carefully at the vial group that uh, is implicit here. So we have these mutations, S sub x, and so we'll let W be the group generated by the S sub x, where the x is a vertex of our graph. Okay, so this is a group of what? It's a group of transformations of this integer linear space. Like this, yes. Now, the reason it's a group is because we have relations that S x squared is the identity, and that s x s y equals s y s x if x and y are uh, not neighbors. I suppose if x not, is not equal y. And the grade relation s x s y s x equals s y s x s y if x and y are neighbors. And 
said that it's then a theorem which is closely connected to the theorem that we had before that this group W is uh, finite precisely when uh, x is A D. Okay, so I want to have a look at uh, some examples here. So let's look at A2. So A2 is just the very simple um, case where you have these two things here. And so that means we have two, um, two generators. W is group generated by just two elements, S1, S2. This relation is S1 squared equals S2 squared equals the identity. And a single braid relation S1, S2, S1 equals S2, S1, S2. Okay, so that's well known to be a symmetric group on three things. And uh, this relation here, given these ones here, could be replaced with the, the relation S1, S2 cubed equals the identity. So given these relations, this one is an alternate formulation. So I want to just uh, show you uh, the meaning of, of these things and the more familiar view of the symmetric group by uh, doing a bit of permutations here. So here are three things. So here's a big object, a medium object, and a small object. And I'm going to do some permuting, okay? So uh, from your point of view, we'll call this one number one, and this one number two, and this one number three. These are the three positions. And the usual understanding of these generators of the symmetric group is that S1 permutes the things in, in first and second position, and S2 permutes the things in the second and third position. So I've just done S1 followed by S2. If I now do another S1, I've now done S1, S2, S1. And you see that the order of things has interchanged. So now let me convince you of the truth of the braid relations by doing starting with the same original configuration and doing them in the other order. So instead of doing S1 first, I'll do S2 first, and then S1, and then S2. Okay, so we see that we end up with the same thing that we did uh, in the other way around. So this is a, a fundamental thing, but from our point of view, these S's are not moving things around in three dimensions. They are actually acting on populations on this graph. So let's view it from that point of view by starting with a, a general population. So I'm going to write the population values as A and B on this graph. So this is a population, population P. And I'm going to perform the, the operations S1. So if I perform S1 here at the level of the mutation, what do I get? I get minus A minus A plus B, that's the effect of mutating there, and the other one is just B, so I might put a, a bracket there. It's a bracket. If I do S2 to this, I have to make that negative and add A, so I get A and um, A minus B. If I now do S2 to this, I have to negate that and add this one, so this one stays unchanged. I'm negating B and I'm adding minus A plus B, so that'll be a minus A. And if I do S1 here, I will get the, the minus A and I add that one. I'll get minus B and A minus B. And then if I do final S1 here, I'm going to get uh, minus this thing. So it's A minus B plus A minus A. Uh, that's minus B, yeah. So I get minus B uh, minus A. And just to check if that's the same thing I get uh, there. If I do S2 finally, I get I negate that, so I get minus A plus B, and then I add minus B, and I get minus B minus A. So uh, what we have here is the, first of all, the verification of this basic uh, braid relation in the context of the mutation game. And it allows us to actually write down matrices for um, the various elements in the symmetric group. So from our point of view here, S3 
is, well, there's the identity element, doesn't do anything. And these are now matrices because we're really acting on a two-dimensional space. The S1 is uh, this action here. It sends A, B to minus A plus B, B. So as a matrix acting on the right, this would be uh, minus 1, 0, 1, 1. Let me just illustrate that. So if I take uh, A, B, and I act by S1, that's the same as A, B, um, minus 1, 1, 0, 1. So the effect of going from here to, to uh, minus a plus b, that effect is the same as multiplying by this matrix. So this matrix represents the S1. And the S2 is represented by 1, 1, 0, minus 1. And then the various products are minus 1, minus 1, 1, 0. This is the product S1 times S2, which is the cumulative effect here. It's that exactly that entry there. And we have 0, 1, minus 1, minus 1, that's S2, S1, that's exactly the cumulative entry there. And the final one there is just the uh, thing that interchanges and negates. So that's S1, S2, S1, which equals S2, S1, S2. So this is a two-dimensional version of the symmetric group. Maybe often we think of the symmetric group of three letters as being uh, permutations of three things and represented by three by three matrices. So this is a two-dimensional two representation, it's an irreducible representation of S3. So S3 has three representations, that is three ways of representing it as matrices. Uh, this is the only irreducible way of doing it uh, so that we get uh, different matrices for the, the, the group elements. So what we see is that the, uh, the mutation game automatically provides us with a, a representation, a realization of the, the group uh, with very explicit matrices. So now, of course, we could do this uh, for uh, more general things. So for example, we could do it, go one step up to the, the A3 case. So for A3, where we have this as our, our graph, now we have generators S1, S2, and S3. And the usual story is that we can represent those by um, actions on four things. Now we have four things. And I'm going to show you uh, the corresponding sort of trail down here. Okay. So if I do S1 first, from your point of view, this is S1, this is S2, this is S3. Okay. So I'm going to do S1 first. And then I do uh, S2. And then I do S3. If I now do S1 and S2, and another S1, then I have inverted the order. This is the longest element in, the, in, in, in this situation. This is the, the most complicated permutation from this point of view. It takes the longest to get to this one. But that's not the only way I could have gotten that, if I had played this game a different way. I could also have gotten that same permutation by doing this, by doing S1 first, and then S3, and then S2. And then doing that a second time. Another S1, another S3, another S2. So I've just shown you that uh, there's a braid relation here, but the, the sort of the longest element in W. Uh, first of all, I showed it to you as S1, S2, S3 times S1, S2, S1. And then I showed it to you as S1, S3, S2, all squared. Now, more generally, what we could do is we could understand uh, this group. This W is, of course, a symmetric group on uh, four things, which has uh, order 24. 
we can understand that or get a, a re representation for it by starting with the general population on our graph and then showing what the, these elements actually do. So in this case, if we started like this, A, B, C, there's actually sort of three directions to go. We can go in S1, or we can go in S2, or we can go in S3. Let me show you what would happen in those three directions. So under S1, we would get minus A plus B, a mutation there, and then the B and C would be unchanged. We did have S2, then there'd be a minus B plus A plus C in the middle term, and the other two would be unchanged. And if we did S3, we'd get the A, B, and minus C plus A plus B. No A in the... Huh? Just minus A plus B. Minus C plus B, thank you. Yes, minus C plus B. So what ends up happening then is that we could draw a similar diagram to the one that we've just done, but we would get uh, actually a three-dimensional object consisting of 24 nodes instead of a two-dimensional object with six nodes. Instead of getting this hexagon, we would get what's called a permutahedron. And that's an important... Uh, sort of object to study the symmetric group. So here is the permutahedron. Here's the permutahedron. Okay. It is actually, uh, as a polytope, it's an octahedron. This is an octahedron, one of the platonic solids. Uh, it's an octahedron that has had its uh, tops chopped off. We just chop off all of the the pointed side, so it's not so pointed, so we want to use it as a soccer ball, so we can chop off the sides. And in such a way that uh, the sides then are, these things here uh, give us, uh, you get hexagons in, in the middle. Okay, so what ends up happening here is that um, these, these um, three directions give us hexagons and squares. Okay, so hexagons, when we have the uh, the braid relation. So between S1 and S2, that's a braid relation. That will give us uh, the same kind of two-dimensional story we had there. And similarly, uh, between S2 and S3, there will be a braid relation, so we're giving us another hexagon. But between S1 and S3, those are commuting. Because they're commuting, we will get a square instead. Square. There's one there, one there, and And that's what we're getting here. Uh, have a look at it later. So this is uh, where's the identity? Uh, started marking them. So there's if we consider this to be the identity, then uh, that's the square with with sides which are labeled by S1 and S3. And this is a hexagon, one of hexagons, and that's the other hexagon. And the whole S4 looks like this. And as we proceed from the top to the bottom, we are progressing in complexity in the, in the vial group. The expression of the elements is getting longer as we, we proceed to the bottom element. The bottom element here is the, the, the bigger one that I already showed you, the, the transformation that reverses all, all things. And what I showed you was two different paths to go from here down to here. Each, each one of these is an S1 or an S2 or an S3. They're all labeled. And so it's an, it becomes an interesting question, how many paths are there from, from, say, this one to the bottom one, or more generally from this one to any other one? That's a very important uh, kind of question in, in representation theory and proximity group kind of thing. Okay, so that's a rather touching base with something rather elementary, the symmetric group. But now we just observe that the setup is, is general in the sense that the vial group that we've introduced has, uh, has manifestations for all of these. And that means that the same story will be happening, or a similar story will be happening for all of these. In particular, you can uh, create these uh, permutahedrons for each of the vial groups. This, uh, suddenly you become, uh, some things become highly non-trivial, because if you have a polytope in n-dimensional space, there is at least three non-trivial questions that you can ask. One of them is, what is its 
combinatorial face combinatorial structure. It has faces. In higher dimensions, you have faces, but also lower dimensional things called facets. And there's containment relations. This, this facet is contained in, in this face and in this face. So there's a combinatorial structure associated to the faces and facets. And then there's also the volume. And there's also the number of lattice points in here. So these are three canonical questions that you, you're interested in whenever you have a higher dimensional polytope. And so uh, the answers to those questions for these um, other ones, I don't know what the answers are. I'm not sure. I'm sure these people have looked at it, but uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we are still uh, maybe a little bit unsure as to the answers. OK, so now I want to move to the geometry. I want to introduce geometry to the story so that all of this takes on a geometrical aspect. Up till now, it's only been combinatorial or maybe algebraic, but there's actually a lot of geometry involved here. Okay, so the canonical quadratic form. bilinear form. Okay, so we started with x, our, our graph, and now we're going to introduce a symmetric bilinear form on, well, on our, on our populations. And we're going to do that by, well, it's a symmetric bilinear form, it's like a dot product. So this has basis consisting of the simple Populations alpha 1, alpha 2, up to alpha n. And so to specify a dot product, it suffices to say what the dot products of uh, two of those are. Okay, so we're going to define alpha sub x, um, I'll write alpha sub x, dot alpha sub y equals 2 if x equals y, and minus 1 if x and y are neighbors. And zero other ones. So it's given by a matrix. So for example, if we have um, so for example, if we have A4. So 1, 2, 3, and 0. So if I make 1, 2, 3, and 0, 1, 2, 3, and 0. So the matrix for the quadratic form, or the bilinear form, is just the this thing called the dot product. So each of the vectors is a, has a dot product of 2 with itself. And then there's minus 1s and zeros elsewhere. Minus 1 if you, things are adjacent. So 2 is adjacent to 1. Um, and uh, Two is adjacent to three. It's also adjacent to zero, I suppose. I guess the rest would be one, two, three. Yeah. So there's the adjacency matrix. That's the matrix for this quadratic form. And now the main theorem, which is actually easy to check, is that mutations S sub X is an isometry. With respect to this form for any vertex x. So the reflections that we had before are now actually isometries. The mutations are actually now actual real reflections, i.e., they really deserve to be called. Deserve the name reflections. Okay, so uh, the proof is very simple. It's just uh, some cases. Uh, let me sort of illustrate the proof idea just with an example. So I suppose that we're in, just to be specific and concrete, I will just uh, give an example. So suppose that so we have our E6 graph and we've labeled things like this. And suppose that, for example, we're interested in, in verifying that S3 is an isometry. 
okay, what does it mean to check that something's an isometry? It means that we want that uh, we want to show that if uh, we have any populations, alpha i dot alpha j, we take the dot product of any two basis elements, then that's going to be the same as um, what happens when we apply s sub x to either of them. Right? That's that's the basic property that we need to check s sub x. Uh, acting on alpha i and alpha j. Okay, so why is that? Well, uh, let me uh, give you an illustration. So suppose that we have um, alpha sub 2 dot uh, alpha sub 0. Okay, so these two are not neighbors, so according to uh, the dot product, this should be 0. Now let's look at what happens to them under the mutation S sub 3. So we're going to look at what happens to them under S3. So we're interested, is this the same thing as alpha 2 acted on by S sub 3 dot alpha 0 acted on by S sub 3? Is that correct? So what is alpha 2 acted on by S3? We have a 1 here and we act by S3. The mutation gives us alpha 2 plus alpha 3. Right? If we have a 1 here, and we, we mutate here, then we're going to get a 1 here and a 1 here. So the alpha 2 is going to go to alpha 2 plus alpha 3. And similarly, the alpha 0 is going to go to alpha 0 plus alpha 3. Okay, so what is that dot product? Well, there's four terms. The alpha 2 dot alpha 0, that's uh, 0, we already know that. The alpha 2 dot alpha 0, uh, we want that one. The alpha 2 dot alpha 3, so there'll be an alpha 2 dot alpha 3, there'll be an alpha 3 dot alpha 0, and there'll be an alpha 3 dot alpha 3. Okay, what are these things? Alpha 2 and alpha 3, they're neighbors, so their dot product is minus 1. Alpha 3 and alpha 0, they're neighbors, so their dot product is minus 1. And alpha 3 dot alpha 3, they're equal, so their dot product is 2. So the total is 0. So we've checked that for these particular, if we're mutating at some vertex and we have two adjacent neighbors, then yes, it acts as a mutation. And so you make a few other computations that are similar like this to cover the other cases, and you check that in all of the cases, we have an isomer. Which one? The alpha two S three. No, we now we're acting now we're acting not at the level of populations, but actually at the at the level of uh, basis vectors. So alpha two is is um, is a basis vector, which is a population, which is a one there. So if we mutate here, then that that population of one there will give us a a, a minus a minus zero plus one, which is one. We go from 1 here to a 1, 1. That's the effect of the, uh, the S3 on the singleton alpha 2. Okay, so this is great. That, that means we have geometry here. We, we have a bilinear form, a symmetric bilinear form on a, an n-dimensional space, actually integral thing n-dimensional space, that's a very rich situation. And we have a bunch of isometries, in fact, so our entire group is a group of isometries. So the vial group is a group of isometries. That's fabulous. Now, uh, so when you have isometries, the main question, the first question that you ask probably is, what's the nature of this quadratic form? Okay, there's three typical uh, situations. If we call this quadratic form M, then there's three situations. So the first is that M is positive definite. Positive definite. That means that uh, if we apply X, M, X transpose is always bigger than or equal to zero. Actually, it's always uh, bigger than or equal to zero. Bigger than zero if uh, X is not zero. Uh, the second possibility is that M is 
something called semi-positive definite, and that's the x m x transpose is always bigger than or equal to zero. And then uh, the third one is that m is otherwise. I'm not sure what the name is. Um, if it's not one of these, other one, other one of these. So sometimes it's negative, sometimes positive. <laughs> Indefinitely. Okay. okay, so we have these different, uh, three different geometries. We have a, a bilinear form. This is always the case. It's sort of the first question you ask. Which of these three situations are we in? And the answer, it's not too hard to see. By, you can make a direct computation. How do you check whether this is positive definite or not? Well, you can look for eigenvalues. Eigenvalues are a little bit outside our computational zone because this is a concrete math seminar. <laughs> so we're not actually in possession of eigenvalues as exact values. We can compute eigenvalues to 20 decimals like a computer can, but we can't actually get eigenvalues exactly. But it turns out we don't actually need to do that. All we need to do is calculate determinants. So if you calculate this determinant, and then you calculate this determinant, and you calculate this determinant, calculate those determinant, that determinant, calculate those four determinants, if they're all positive, then the thing is positive definite. If one of them is zero and the others are positive, then you've got uh, semi-definite. And if one of them is positive and the other is negative, then you're in an indefinite situation. So you can ch we can check which of these situations we're in just by making determinate calculations. And then it turns out that the situations correspond exactly to our ADE uh, stories, so that the positive definite uh, happens exactly with A, A the graph is AD, this uh, positive, uh, semi-positive definite exactly happens when you have an ADE tilde, and this happens otherwise. So from the geometrical point of view, uh, the geometries that we're getting from all these graphs, the, the ADEs are giving us familiar Euclidean kind of geometries, essentially Euclidean geometry. The affine ones are giving ones which are almost Euclidean, but a little bit more complicated. And these other ones are giving us things which are sort of like hyperbolic geometry, or, or the positive and negative entries along the diagonal. So it's, uh, it's a more complicated. And these, are, these facts are closely connected to the finiteness of the vial group because, because we have our vial group which is acting as isometries on this integral lattice and the uh, positive definiteness will imply that the, the unit spheres are is, is essentially uh, compact and so there's only a finite possible number of elements in, in the vial group possible. Now, um, so now that we have this geometry, we can now talk about the geometry of the, the roots. So now the roots that we have, we can look at them now in a, in a new way. So on the R of X, which are the set of roots, um, now we can make sense to talk about a root system. So the roots is actually a root system. So this is a geometrical configuration in a, well, traditionally a Euclidean space, but it doesn't have to be a Euclidean space, just a space with a uh, in a product. So what, uh, what's going on here? So let me illustrate with an example, the standard one. So this is the standard story of the A2 system, okay, where we have six vectors forming a regular hexagon. Here's the origin. And these vectors have certain the set of vectors is a root system. And what does that mean? It means uh, three things, or at least three things. So um, it's actually a special kind of root system. It's not the most general kind, so maybe let me say simply laced root system. So first of all, all the vectors are the have the same quadrants. I have to remind you, but if you have a quadratic form, then the quadrants of the vector is V dot. Because we 
I'm not sure that our form is positive definite, so we can't talk about a square root. We don't want to talk about square roots anyway, because we can't compute the square roots. But uh, in any case, v dot v is the natural thing. That's the algebraic uh, quadrants. So all of these roots have the same quadrants, and the quadrants is always 2. OK. Uh, the other property is that if you take a reflection associated to any one of these, by that we mean we take a perpendicular hyperplane to any one of these vectors. That's a, so that's a, an element alpha, then maybe the corresponding hyperplane is h sub alpha. That the reflection in h sub alpha will preserve the root system. So if h sub alpha is the hyperplane perpendicular to alpha, and let's say s, let's denote by s sub alpha to be the reflection in h sub alpha. So s sub alpha now will be this. Then uh, two things happen. First of all, um, S alpha sends the, the entire system, R of x to R of x. So the roots are all preserved under reflections, under any reflection to any root. And secondly, uh, the actual multiples involved are integers. So vector v, and we have phi s alpha, then what we're going to get is we're going to get v minus some constant, and the constant is 2 times v dot alpha over alpha dot alpha times alpha. That's the formula for the um, reflection in the hyperplane for a vector. Then uh, this quantity here, the condition is, that's a general formula, the condition is that this thing here is always, always an integer. So, uh, so for example, to go from here to here, we're taking this vector and we're subtracting exactly one copy of alpha. That's alpha. That's minus alpha. That's alpha. And to go from here to here, we're subtracting exactly two copies of alpha. So that's what's uh, it's called the root system. And uh, those have been studied for a long time. Uh, maybe Thinkin originally came up with Thinkin diagrams to describe root systems and the relations that, uh, that happen uh, with them. And there are sort of irreducible root systems and the, uh, well, the root, irreducible root systems are exactly the ones that we've already just system and if and in the positive definite case in the Euclidean case we have a sort of standard Euclidean space the irreducible okay, simply laced root systems Are just the R of X's where X is A and B. Systems. What does the irreducible idea mean? Uh, that you can't split your vector space up and as a sum, so there's a root, you're not, you're not taking a sum of root spaces or sort of orthogonal root spaces. And that corresponds to simply laced? No, the simply laced is, corresponds to the fact that our, all our, our roots are of the same length. Yeah, they, 
there's more general situations where we consider root systems that have vectors of different lengths, like for the Bn or Cn. Okay, I'm out of time. I was going to talk about lattices, but uh, maybe I'll talk about that uh, next time with some other things. So, uh, thanks for it.